Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Susan Singer. I'm the Vice President for Academic Affairs and Provost here at Rollins College. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to what promises to be a fascinating conversation this afternoon. Today's program is made possible by the Gertrude Cole Scholar Fund, established by William Edward Cole in honor of his mother. Mr. Cole was an advocate for the cultural and intellectual exchange between the United States and the United Kingdom and a loyal member of the English Speaking Union. The fund supports visiting scholars from the UK and Rollins scholars visits to the UK to add new knowledge and productive dialogue to our campus. We are honored that renowned British artist Paul Day is currently serving as a Gertrude Scholar, Gertrude Cole Scholar, excuse me. Mr. Day's best known work may be his monumental sculpture, The Meeting Place, at St. Pancras International Station in London. But he's also the creator of finely detailed works, including the Battle of Britain Monument and the Queen Mother Memorial. If you are interested in learning more about Paul's work beyond today's conversation, we have some visuals in the background here and out in the lobby, there are books of Paul's work that you might find fascinating. We are extraordinarily fortunate that Rollins College is the site of his most recent work, the tribute to Fred, Mr. Rogers, titled A Beautiful Day for a Neighbor, which was unveiled yesterday. This afternoon, Mr. Day will engage with Dr. Grant Cornwell, in addition to having served as Vice President of St. Lawrence University, President of the College of Worcester, and now in his seventh year as the 15th President of Rollins College, Dr. Cornwell is a professor of philosophy. I have the privilege of co-teaching with him this semester. He's an extraordinary professor. Please join me in welcoming the artist and the philosopher as they consider artistic visions from the public eye. Can't wait for your conversation. Well, good afternoon, folks. Just wanna make sure everybody can hear us and, and oh, we're getting a little feedback there. <coughs> gonna wait till that settles out a bit. Maybe a bit more. Okay, good. Oh. <laughs> Is it my voice? Should I move the mic or, or are you going to be able to adjust that feedback? Okay, all right, good. Um, well, thank you for coming. Um, I feel like I'm having a conversation with an old friend because it's true. Uh, we have been in conversation now for a couple of years, Indeed. really, about, uh, about this project. So my first question, Paul, is, how do you feel? And let me elaborate a bit. For months and months and months, you have immersed yourself in this project, living and breathing it. I haven't seen your studio and workspace, but I know enough from conversation to know that uh, you would go out to the studio <coughs> and spend all day, every day, a a immersed in creating this work of art. Um, and now you've left it, now you've brought it here. And are you gonna be able to leave? <laughs> it's like the question that somebody asked me whether I feel regret when I come to destroy a piece of work that I've given a year to. Uh -huh. Not at all. I'm very glad to see the back of it because I have a clean <laughs> studio and I can start something new. Uh -huh. Okay, I'll try and respond succinctly. I am elated with the way in which the sculpture and the courtyard and the architecture have come together. Mm -hmm. I think that there is a balance and a, um, a rightness, a fittingness mm -hmm. for this work. And there was an element of chance in the equation because when I designed the work and uh, decided upon a scale that I thought was suitable, I didn't at the time know where we were going to put it. Um, whereas normally, um, in the, the various locations I've put monuments in the past, the place itself, the location, is a very important character in the designing, in the scaling, in all the thought process about the design of a work. In this case, I flew in blind a little bit uh, to the subject, but that surprise mm -hmm. 
has been a, a godsend. Yeah. Um, obviously, you know, this moment is like the after party, the rap party after having produced a film for me. I spend, uh, you know, a year, 18 months working in a solitary fashion in my studio. Yes. Obviously, Mrs. Day is there to make cups of tea and to uh, keep body and soul together, and of course she sometimes helps in the process. But it is uh, a cloistered, uh, almost monastic process. Yeah. Um, I don't work, for example, with music very often, because I find that the music interferes with my thought processes. And um, so those hours and hours that run into thousands in silence have to be nourished with some sort of thought life. In this case, because I came to Fred, uh, Mr. Rogers, as, as a total novice, I was able to um, sort of feed my soul and my mind and my reflections with words and video clips and so on that uh -huh. played almost on a loop in my own mind mm -hmm. while I was working. So just to press it a, a little bit further, um, what's your relationship with the object now? When you see it, do you feel part of it? Do you feel possessive of it? Or is it now something you've created that you've given to the world? Definitely the latter. Okay. Um, obviously, there's a little voice in my head that's quite proud of leaving a mark on a landscape yes. that is going to outlive me and hopefully other generations too. Um, but, you know, uh, my giving to the project is primarily in the effort and in the discipline just to make the thing, and you'll see later on some of the work involved, um, so that when the bronze is complete, and of course to make the bronze, I, I pass the sculpture over to a whole team of people who will be working technically without the passion, without the artistic vision, but they still invest an awful lot of themselves. So at that point, mm -hmm. um, I'm already taking my hands off the project a little bit. I'm project managing, I'm going to, to make changes and minor details and so on, minor adjustments. But I sort of detach myself from that, that effort and start to see it blossom mm -hmm. and bloom into life as a bronze. The, 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 the actual um, locating, installation of the work, of course, is, is critical uh, because that's the first time that we'll see whether there is a balance, whether the things are fitting, um, whether there are technical problems that might arise. So on in this case, really and truly, I see it as a... I've been paid. It's not a gift, obviously. I have been paid. Um, but I feel that my uh, input artistically is a form of gift. Um, the work will take on a life of its own. Mm -hmm. People will take ownership of it in their own way. Mm -hmm. And the most important thing for me is that it sparks conversation, mm -hmm. that it touches people in different ways. Mm -hmm over a long period of time. Yeah. So I want to talk about that more later. But um, I, in this conversation, I'd like to change altitudes with our questions a bit and, yes. and go to kind of lofty, interesting, philosophical <coughs> questions, the very specific material curiosities that I have. And I have one now. Um, you know, whenever you see a public bronze somewhere that's part of, become really part of public culture, it turns out that there is some place or places that the public touches, literally touches, mm -hmm. again and again, a thousand times mm -hmm. until it becomes burnished. Yes. So I have two questions. First of all, because you know bronze, I'd just love to know how does that work? How does, how does that burnish happen chemically and physically? And also, as you think of this sculpture, what places do you think will be touched? I do have personal experience, obviously, of what you're describing. Mm -hmm. Um, and notably, I believe that the foot, the toe of St. Peter in the Basilica in Rome has been yes. replaced on numerous occasions. Bronze is a soft copper alloy with 70% copper. Um, it is patinated with a chemical process to color the copper in the bronze. And the only thing that's protecting that chemical process, that patina, are layers of wax. So, of yeah. course, the sticky oil on fingers rub, very quick, rub away very quickly the, uh, the wax and expose the raw bronze, which after time, uh, surprisingly, the abrasive uh, uh, nature of skin will polish the surface down to a mirror, mirror finish mm. and eventually remove microns of bronze until you wear a hole in it. Now, that might take several hundred years, I hope, but <laughs> um, 
in St Pancras, uh, where there's this large sculpture on a plinth surrounded by uh, a long frieze, people engage with the frieze very intimately over a long period of time. I've had people in who work in the restaurant next door say that the average time of, of visits to the statue is about 25 minutes. Wow. And people are going around the base exploring the stories that are contained within the reliefs. There is a dog, and the nose of the dog has, of course, been petted by <laughs> tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of visitors. And I believe we will have to cast a new nose <laughs> at some point. Um, there is also a scene of um, First World War soldiers coming back from the front uh, because St Pancras Station was used as a, uh, 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 um, a, a transit station uh -huh. for soldiers going to and from the war. Uh, and so there, are, there is a line of soldiers coming back and uh, there's a hand of a boy reaching out to a soldier and that hand must have been clasped many, many uh -huh. times. Uh -huh. So with Mr Rogers, um, I observed a little this morning of uh, how people were interacting with it, just the beginnings, yeah. and of course it's very encouraging. And we must get onto the subject of the artistic vision and public yeah. art as well, because there's interesting things to say there. But, um, I, I, but the hand of Mr. Rogers that's not cont that isn't covered by Daniel is sort of reaching out a uh -huh. little bit, and I think that people, some people will be able to want to hold, clasp the hand of Mr. Rogers for a photo, like shaking his hand. Yeah. Uh, Daniel, I'm sure, will be stroked and reached and so on. Um, one thing that I mentioned before, uh, I believe, in our conversation was that the, the puppets at the back of the sculpture, uh -huh. I, I, I imagine parents lifting their children up to sort of, you know, paw uh -huh. at those. Uh -huh. um, only time will tell, but yeah. the lovely thing is, for me, making these public pieces and, and where my artistic vision is in service to an idea or a subject, um, people turn it into their own. It becomes their own. Yes. Um, yes. And so I am just delighted when people converse with it. Yes. But it, but it is so interesting about bronzes because, of course, we're all taught to be kind of, to kind of revere art, works of art, mm. and by all means, don't ever touch them but mm. a bronze invites to be touched. So that's a fascinating... Yes, and it's, and it's frustrating for the sculptor at times. Ah. I, do, I do a lot <laughs> of bronze for uh, the interior, and I use colour in my bronzes. I, if you've looked at my work at all, you'll notice that a lot of it is, is, is high relief, um, architectural reliefs, spatially complex, and they are scenes. They're like three-dimensional pictures, a sort of... Um, a physical virtual reality. There's a sort of virtuality about the perspective. Um, and uh, using the colour, um, it's almost as if I'm uh, putting, not painting the work, but as a watercolourist would just give nuances. Well, if people were to touch those too often, then that uh -huh. would all disappear, and, uh -huh. and that, that would alter the character of the work completely. Okay, so some touching, but not a lot of touching. <laughs> <laughs> So wh I think it's time. Why don't you? I, I think it'd be fascinating if you took us through the creative process, uh, because uh, was it was it twenty months or two years of your life devoted to this? And almost. Yeah, and I, I think it's a, would be fascinating from the time that the idea was proffered, the stages you had to go through of research and reflection, uh, and then and then creativity to what we have here, yeah. and maybe you could also show us some of the material yes. process. I will, I will. Uh, to, in to introduce this, um, and I hope I'm not boring anybody who's heard this already, um, I did not know Mr. Rogers at all. I'd never heard the name, and um, he was, could have been anybody, uh, the president of a golf club or a bank manager. So um, to, to start with this process, um, I, I needed to immerse myself into the subject and learn about who the man was, what he did, what his values were, start to build up in my mind um, uh, an, an iconography, an image bank of those mm. key moments. Posthumous portraiture for a sculptor, is, as you can imagine, is very difficult. The man is no longer with us. I can't get him, invite him into my studio to sit and pose. Mm. So somehow I've got to create, um, to resurrect Mr. Rogers sculpturally. And uh, to do that, um, I need, to, uh, un I need to, to, to get to grips with him physically, find as many pictures as I can of his face from multiple angles. 
Uh, that's not easy uh, because obviously people age over time. So I have to think about creating almost like a synthesized image of Mr. Rogers that is my own invention, nourished by all the pictures of him, but at the same time is a sort of sublimed Mr. Rogers. It's the Mr. Rogers that everyone hopefully will recognize whether they watched him in the 1970s or the 1990s. Somehow I've got to create that image. Research is vital, of course, to, to understand how to create a picture of Mr. Rogers. The original brief stated or asked for a statue. I didn't feel that a statue was at all appropriate given that there are three already in existence and that Mr. Rogers himself would have would have really felt uncomfortable at being put on a plinth or a pedestal. He always deflected the attention away from himself to the others, to the children in particular. Being totally ignorant of Mr. Rogers, I was able to have the surprise encounter with him and with the program, and that surprise encounter basically led me to the conclusion that Mr. Rogers needs to be doing what he loved to do best, and he needed to be immersed in and communicating with children but also the sculpture could tell other people a little bit of the story of Mr. Rogers' The Neighborhood program, which is why I felt it important to create the sort of backdrop of the, of the castle of make-believe, which I think is an absolutely genial idea, as well as these sort of ragtag band of puppets, which are so, it's so hard to imagine how he brought those to life mm. with such energy and such um, persuasion, mm -hmm. because they're, to my eyes, you know, very, very poor quality puppets. <laughs> however, however, the character, obviously, that Mr. Rogers introduces into them is spellbinding. And partly, the, 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 the nature of the puppet and just the power mm -hmm. of what's said um, is, was, was part of my thinking. I'm a puppeteer, in a sense. You know, I make these statuettes, sculptures. Mm -hmm. I want my characters to transmit messages. I want them to commune and communicate mm. to the viewer. So, um, sorry, I must move on. That's the thought process. The actual practical process is, um, imagine starting with a blank sheet of paper and uh, perhaps a ball of clay and some ideas and some visual images. Well, then I have to think about how to put this character into a situation that can be believable, uh, that can be beautiful, uh, nicely composed. And I spent three months um, both on research and on a playful exploration of possible solutions. The early solutions are absolutely atrocious, and I would be embarrassed mm. to show you, but I would show them to show how tentatively the process starts. You, I just don't know where it's going. But bit by bit, I piece together my composition in clay, small models until I have an idea and a composition that I think is worthy to submit to the commissioners, and then we discuss whether it's possible. Mm. From that point, when we've agreed, a, when we've agreed a, on a design, then I start the process of making, which is what I can probably show you now. Actually, just before you go there, yeah. um, this is fascinating, and I think it just really gets to the heart of what I find most fascinating, because uh, you are both a highly skilled craftsman and an artist, and you, and you can't be one without being the other, um, you're going to take us through, if you will, sort of the craft. But what I find to be the deepest and most moving thing that you do is um, you transform soul into bronze, right? So it's not just that you are creating an image that is a proper likeness. Mm. You, are take, you, you had to discern Mr. Rogers' soul in a way and then have it come to light come to come to bronze okay first point i disagree that the artist has to be a craftsman because we live in an age when most artists don't have much craft interesting and very often they they um they push out the craft to people who are real craftsmen but they stick their name on it and that's something that's troubling because the quest the second bit of the question about soul yeah. that's where i feel both research, which is obviously a sort of academic process, that leads to a change of heart and a sense in which Mr. Rogers inhabits me here. That was helped by the meeting with Joanne Rogers and it made the, it made the whole process 
extremely personal because mm -hmm. the widow of Mr. Rogers, the love of his life, was entrusting me with the responsibility of making a sort of a final memorial to her husband. And that responsibility really gets under the skin. Mm. And that's one of the forces that gets me up in the morning and go to work in this cold, frosty studio of mine. <laughs> so shall I? Sure, please. So this please is just, that. as it were, technical. And I'll try and be brief because it's not that interesting. Um, is there any way of just dimming the lights a little bit? So my wife reminds me all the time to be concise. I'll try and be concise. <laughs> okay, so um, first phase, build three trolleys. Interestingly enough, of course, the trolley is in the neighborhood. My trolleys are so that I can build my clay onto um, a surface that comes apart, which later facilitates mold making. This is three weeks worth of woodwork. You can see the maquettes on the desk there, um, and you can, Start to see, no, just the desk, just the maquettes on the desk. Okay, so that's trolley building. Um, sorry, that's gone twice. Can we go back one? No, we can't go back. Okay, um, can we go back at all? So there we go. So um, next phase, the trolleys are uh, situated just there. You see a wheel. I have to design them so that they can take the weight of the clay. In this case, there was going to be three tons of clay, roughly, plus steel, so very, very solid. Um, here I am cutting out blocks of polyurethane foam. It's a lightweight material that's easily easy to carve, and that fills the bulk of the mass of the sculpture so that it's not just all clay. Had I not used this material, I would have used six or seven tons of clay to make the sculpture, and that would be impossible for me to move around the studio. Uh, it's a very, very, dis dis it's, it's a horrible process. The dust goes absolutely everywhere. I'm using a chainsaw. Next slide, here we go. This is now having carved out my blocks of poly polyurethane foam, I then get into the welding of the steel armature. Clay is very heavy, and it needs to be supported on a skeleton, as we are. So that skeleton is made of large lumps of steel, and here I'm cutting up an old armature of some chickens, giant chickens, uh, and recycling the material to build Mr. Rogers. Here we have the first trolley. You can see that my model is also divided into three, because I'm sort of making an enlargement. And so I am roughing out the skeleton of the first four characters. And this is a very sort of, um, it's not a mathematical process. Some people and some sculptors in the past have used um, pent pantographs, which, which measure the points on a, on a small object and then enlarge them on the big object. I tend to do this by eye. Paul, just a second. Yeah. Go back one, if you can. Yep. Or, yeah. Uh, this machine isn't. There. Yeah. Oh. No. <laughs> okay, there right we go. No. Okay, I'll let you do it. Sorry, I'll let you do it. <laughs> right. Uh, I just noticed on the shelves, all yep. of these studies. Yes. Are those all Mr. Rogers studies? No, 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 not at all. That's just a, a, like a stockpile of bits of sculpture and ideas that yeah. uh, accumulate yeah. in my workshop. Yeah. And Frank, you know something about that. <laughs> so, next phase. Um, uh, so, here we go. What now, you can start to see bringing the armature and the blocks of foam together. I'm welding up bits of armature and obviously cutting and changing and, you know, it doesn't come necessarily right first time. Next slide. Here we go. A little bit more detail. Uh, the polyurethane is wrapped in tape and then covered in chicken wire. Um, the machine goes a bit fast. There we go. So you can just start to see, you know, the, the skeletons, as it were, appearing. Okay, I'm starting to put on clay. Sorry, I'm not really in control of this, gentlemen. Do you have? Um, try again. Come on, go. There we go. So that's roughing out the clay. Basically, um, I have bins of clay all around me, and I take handfuls of the stuff, and I initially sort of throw it onto the sculpture, and then I use a lump of wood and sort of beat it into shape to start to sketch out the rough outline of form. Can we go forwards? <laughs> go forwards. Yeah, okay, this is just the process of roughing out, you know, you can start to see the detail. Now, that's an interesting shot because one of, the, one, of the, one of the most painful experiences about this Mr. Rogers sculpture was that every night of every day, I had to soak uh, sheets in cold water and wring them out by hand, wrap the sculpture up and then cover it in plastic. And towards the end of the uh, project, I would spend at least an hour every day wrapping the sculpture 
and then half an hour the next morning unwrapping it. And of course, as you drag wet cloths and place them yeah. over the sculpture, <coughs> you might be sort of pulling across the face and destroy a nose, an ear, the hair. So it is a bit of a painful process, and you'll see a little bit more of that later on. Come on, let's go forward. Okay. Um, now, the portrait is, as I described earlier, very difficult when somebody's not there. And um, no matter how, how many times Fred was photographed and filmed, on the television program, he was always filmed from face on. Very, very rarely is there a glimpse of his profile. And yet, building up a sculptural head, of course, one's looking from every angle. So finding those angles was extremely difficult. And, um, I, and I, I had to dig very deeply into the archives. It took me four attempts, I must have lost about a month of time trying to find the, the key to unlock a likeness of Fred Rogers. You know, I'm not, I'm not Michelangelo, I do my best with the modest abilities I have, but with time, it looks awful. I mean, you know, these were, these were photographs, I don't think I even dared submit these to Joanne, and they weren't ready, it's, this was, you know, this, was, this is a struggle, you know, it's difficult. Making a work of art, it could be a technical struggle, yeah. it could be, um, a, th uh, a theoretical struggle, a sort of um, yeah. a compositional struggle. It's not just, you just go and do it. You have to wrestle with the thing. Um, it's much easier when the character isn't a, a specific person. This is just a generic child, so there's no portrait involved. It's, it, you can hide a multitude of, deep of, of faults and flaws and so on. Well, but can I just, yeah. just, just pause on that for a second? I, I hear what you're saying, but um, you chose the children and then you gave them life and, and soul, too. And yet they're generic children, Yes. but they don't look generic. They look very specific and like they have feelings and they're, they're alive in the bronze. Thanks for asking the question, because children are notoriously difficult in sculpture. I haven't done that many. And this was a first, the, the, you know, here the children are front and center. Um, children so often in sculpture look like cherubs. Mm -hmm. They sort of look angelic. They don't really look like children or they can look like old men. I mean, even going back to the Italian Renaissance, you look at a frieze yes. by, by yeah. Donatello, and some yeah. of the children just look horrific. Uh, th they're monstrous creatures. Yeah. Um, I, did I know not my children were. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to fall into the language of 19th century sentimentality. It yes. was absolutely critical that Fred didn't look like some sort of, you know, um, uh, neo-romantic Jesus with adoring angels. Yes. Um, but at the same time, I didn't want the children to look grumpy and uh, cross with Mr. Rogers. <laughs> um, so, uh, however, I think a lot is said in the attitude, you know, in the direction of gaze, the gesture, the hands, and so on. That can say a lot with the children. Um, and I'm, I, I think, uh, well, I did bring children into the studio, uh, children from a local okay. school. Um, I had a child of a friend who is half Chinese, half French, who also came to... She didn't know she was modeling for her portrait, and she wasn't really, but she was there I, for an afternoon. I got her making fruit and bowls of, bowls of fruit in clay, so she was helping the artist make the sculpture, which, which meant that she was very relaxed. And I was actually working on the portrait of the, um, of the Asian child uh, with, with Ambre next to me, and that was very, very helpful. But um, I worked hard to try and avoid that sort of sentimentality yes. and give the children the characters that Fred would have seen in them because he would have seen in them just a fully formed person albeit a small person yeah. with very little experience I don't know if you I'm sure you've noticed that children can express um, uh, emotion to and they, they can look very old very young they can they can look like the grown-up the, the, their grown-up self very easily when their emotions are, are allowed to come out and so um, that was a challenge for me, and I hope I have, um, you know, realized it. Now, Daniel, um, just to point out the eye, I have a little, sculptors have little tricks, obviously, and one of the little tricks I use is to put a little speck of clay in the eye, and when the light's coming from a certain direction, it gives the eye a glint, and I always feel that sculpture, um, uh, an eye in, s in a sculpture can help to be that lamp of the soul, as it were, to okay. give you the sense okay. that there is life behind this character. Um, so the eyes are very important, as you can see. Mr. Rogers, no, it's gone too. Mr. Rogers has, let's go back one. There we go. Um, forward one. Forward one. Okay, I think it's, no. Oh, well, doesn't matter. So I go, <laughs> here we go. Yeah, you can start to see a little bit of warmth in the eyes. Um, there's no light on them, of course, but um, 
for me, Mr. Rogers was starting to happen at this point. Uh, because this is the first trolley, I'm working around the back and starting to develop, develop the castle. Uh, then I bring into the two other trolleys, and we go on and on. Let's go forward, please. Forward. So you can start to see I'm getting a feel for the overall composition. It's getting there. Um, I've probably, uh, s by this stage, I might be st starting to get a little bit tired of certain aspects of the sculpture. Um, <laughs> you know, well, uh, you, yeah. know you have to live with yeah. it. It's like a relationship, you yeah. know, uh, uh, husband and wife, dare I say. You know, you <laughs> sometimes you irritate each other, you know. And so, um, so in this case, um, after... Catherine, ah, now so there, no. there is Ambre. So that's on, but you can see she's doing two bananas and some uh, oranges. Um, and I think she destroyed my knee, uh, the little girl's knee. She was taking clay from the knee to make her fruit bowl. Um, but that was no problem because was, she was absolutely delightful, that young lady. There she is. Yeah, we're just having a little bit of fun. But you can see, so that's the sort of spirit ambience that sometimes was in the studio. Um, and then we'll move on. That's a wrapping process. Um, as you can see, that's a bit of a... Well, you can imagine, can't you? The, the water's very cold. It's cold in Burgundy. It's really not nice. To keep the clay moist, because the clay over time will harden. It will dry out. And if it dries out on the armature, then I can no longer work with it, and it will crack. So I have to keep it moist. Um, I have to water it at least three times a day and talk to it like a houseplant. <laughs> so there we go. So there... Actually, I'm almost dressed in the same clothes, it's the same shirt. <laughs> so this is, a, this is the moment where I sort of say, I've had enough, yeah. I'm done. And um, Catherine comes along and photographs, you know, and we take some shots just to start to, you know, give people a feel for what the final sculpt, that's the sort of emotional release of, you know, I, I've had enough, <laughs> bye bye Eden, <laughs> bye Drew. And um, so then we move on to the next exciting part of this process, which is the mold making. Um, can we go back a bit? So four people from the foundry came to the studio for a month, and uh, they proceed to destroy my work, um, which is absolutely fine. By that time, I really, really want it out of the studio. Uh, so to make a bronze, you have to make a mold first. Uh, the mold is going to be used to make a wax copy of your sculpture. Um, to make a mold, um, you have to have a front half and a back half, like an Easter egg. You have to be able to separate two sides. So, with a sculpture as complex as this, it requires some surgery. And here we have a, an amputation and, a, and some separators going on. These separators are going to create different parts of mold, which are then painted with... Uh, that gentleman. Thank you. This stuff is uh, silicon rubber. It is painted over the surface of the clay in layers to build up a skin. And that records all the detail on the surface of, and the form of the sculpture. That skin will eventually be the only thing that survives this process. The clay will be destroyed after this. And so if the skin, if the, if the mold skins in the back of a lorry have a crash, I have to remake the sculpture. So I was praying when they were driving back to the Czech Republic that the molds were going to be fine, and they were. But it's a delicate process. You can see, obviously, we have to cut off all sorts of bits, heads, hands, feet, and so on. And then once the rubber is uh, has solidified and the, and the thickness is right, it is backed up with plaster jackets, which obviously preserve the, uh, the form of the mold. Uh -huh. OK, now, foundry shop. Here, a gentleman is. Can I just make an interjection? Yes, of course. Uh, this is fascinating. Um, and for you, this is, this is what you do. So this is all natural and normal. For me, watching this, I can't imagine working that long on something that intricate and beautiful and then just chopping it up. Yeah, no, I, I know. I know. It sounds a little bit cruel, doesn't it? <laughs> I've been doing it so long now that yeah. I, um, uh, it's almost like a sort of relief, actually. Because uh -huh. I know that when they're there, I don't have to go back to the studio at 1 o'clock in the morning uh -huh. and wrap the blooming sculpture up in the freezing cold. You know? yeah. So that's already yeah. something that releases me from a duty. Yes. Um, it also then goes into somebody else's hands for a while. Yes. And I can sort of just like breathe a sigh of relief, go and do something else, make another sculpture, go and mow the lawn, whatever. Yeah. Um, this is a mold where the wax has been painted in, in layers, 
to form a skin which will ultimately become the bronze. And what this gentleman's doing is he's attaching these rods. And the rods are going to feed the bronze into the mold and allow the air to escape from the mold afterwards. And it will become clear as we go forwards. There's one ahead. Um, now, there were 80 different pieces of wax that were cast individually to make the final sculpture. Obviously, you don't cast the whole thing in one go. You cast it piece by piece. I'm just doing some retouching on Mr. Rogers. This is bronze now. This is, this is wax. Oh, this is wax. This is wax. I'm retouching the wax on Mr. Rogers. Forward, here we go. Now, when the wax has been complete and all these rods have been attached, they are placed into large plaster vats. And the plaster in this vat will solidify. And that plaster will then be put into an oven upside down and fired to 1250 degrees C, which is the melting point temperature of bronze. And as you can imagine, as, as, as the kiln heats up, the wax burns out of the mold and it leaves a hole in this plaster mold. And that hole is the space into which liquid bronze will be poured. And that's why it's called the lost wax process, because wax is lost in the process. Forward. Stop. Back. So you can see various molds scattered around the foundry. These are all uh, surrounded by steel sheets and, and anchored with uh, clamps. And the liquid bronze is being poured into the plaster molds. Forward. OK, forward, forward, back. OK, just you can see the liquid bronze is, it pours like water. It's quite incredible, actually. You know, you've got these ingots of bronze that are in a crucible, and bit by bit, as the temperature rises, the metal sort of, you know, congeals and then becomes liquid, and it's just like water. So as the bronze pours into the molds, it will travel everywhere it possibly can, uh -huh. including cracks in the plaster mold, uh, through the bottom of the mold. It will go everywhere. You have to really control it. And of course, while the bronze is going in, the air must come out from every corner of the sculpture, because if there's an air pocket, the bronze will not be able to fill the air pocket. There'll be a, there'll be a lock, uh, and uh, you'll get a hole in your cast. Forward. Is this boring? You sure? Because this is like, for me, this is really boring. I mean, not boring to talk to you, but I mean, I know this stuff. That's what a bronze looks like when it comes out of the mold. So you can see they're cracks. Um, you can see some nails sticking out of the surface. The reason for those nails is that um, on the inside of that head, there's a hole. Uh, and uh, that hole had to be filled with plaster. And that was inside the wax. Well, when the wax has burned away, the plaster inside the head needs to be kept from wiggling around, because if it wiggles around, then you won't get a cast. So you stick nails in the wax. It's monstrous, really. It's completely <laughs> monstrous. It's cruel, isn't it? It's cruel. <laughs> so, so, so the nails the nails are there. She's looking a little sorry. You can see all the feeding rods and so on. Um, that piece will then have to be worked on by a, by a, a, a chiseler for possibly a day or two um, to remove all the imperfections, to drill out the nails, to re-weld to re -weld the holes where the nails once were, and then they have to be hand finished and so on. Forward. Forward. Okay, so you just get a sort of sense of the like the horrible jigsaw puzzle that they've got to somehow put together. 80 different pieces. Forward. Okay, so we've jumped forward here, but you can see weld lines. So um, there, I, th I, I don't know exactly how many meters or yards of weld were on the sculpture. But I think the welding lines would probably go around the perimeter of this room. Uh -huh. And um, those welding lines, um, you can see there, um, they're about uh, sort of half an inch across. That has to be ground down by hand. And then using various tools, you have to make them disappear. You have to make them look like the surface of the clay. Uh, and that requires an awful lot of time. And I do quite a lot of that myself because I go to the foundry sometimes and I think, Honestly, guys, come on, that doesn't en look anything like my... So I go back with, with chisels and hammer, and I'll be doing some chasing work myself just to make those welds disappear, because what we want at the end of the day is a complete and whole-looking object. Underneath it is a stainless steel subframe. Bronze being a soft alloy, it needs to be supported with steel. Okay? And finally, this is me working on the welds. 
Um, work in the world with the boys, obviously. Um, and finally, we start to patinate the work, which is using a blowtorch and um, some chemicals, uh, in this case, uh, ferric nitrate or uh, iron nitrate. And the iron uh, with the heat reacts, um, the iron acid reacts with the copper in the bronze and turns it uh, brown. Um, if it were copper nitrate, it would go greeny blue. And that's done with heat uh, over a period of about a week. Um, and uh, I did actually patinate the work myself because I like to control the, to the tones and the nuances within the patina. Some of the people involved, Misha, and, and, some, and some finished finished pictures. There you go. That's sort of Fantastic. roughly Fantastic. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> yeah. Um, Thank you for sharing that thanks. with us. Okay. Is that okay? I mean, That's fantastic. That's fantastic. You know, I hope it doesn't take too long. No, no. That, that I, I just think that the, to, to for us to be able to see inside the fact that this art has so much craftsmanship uh, underneath it, and many different chapters and layers of yes. craftsmanship. Yeah. Good. So um, I have a couple more questions. So I'm going to ask one more question, and then Let's open it up because maybe thing, there's things you'd like to ask about, whether it's uh, sculpture, art, um, or this particular project. Um, I, I, I can go on for a long time, but I think that we should open it up after this. But here's, my, here's, here's the question that I am really curious in. It's about the relationship between the subject, the artist, and the commissioner. Because, um, you know, throughout all the ages and really throughout cultures, um, some of the greatest works of art that we have have been commissioned. Mm -hmm. um, you know, sometimes I think in popular culture, at least in America, we imagine the artist out in the woods or in the studio al alone with her thoughts, mm -hmm. creating art from nothing, and, then, and that that's somehow true. Um, but you have this intervening relationship where it's a, a three-way dialogue. I'm asking if it is a three-way dialogue mm -hmm. between uh, the subject of your art, you as the artist, and the person or, or organization commissioning the art. And I'm wondering, you know, about your own sense of to whom must you be true? Um, yep. Do you have to be true to the subject? Is that your driving motivation? Do you have to be true to yourself as mm -hmm. the artist? Mm -hmm. Or do you need to be true to the person who has commissioned you to do this? Yeah, I think you've almost answered the question, actually, because that triumvirate of, mm. of, of, of um, being true to is, is key. But we live in an age, obviously, where um, there's a sort of mythology about, the, a mythology about the artist having this sort of unique vision and being almost like a misunderstood uh, visionary. Yeah. Uh, that's been fostered over many, many years. But of course, most of the art we see in museums and so on was directly a result of commissioning, where the artist um, used uh, uh, his craft or skills, or his or her craft <laughs> or skills, um, to illustrate an idea that wasn't necessarily theirs, that didn't necessarily belong to them. And um, uh, I think that many, uh, many people in the art world um, look down their noses at a commissioned artwork because it's somehow considered to be a lesser form of art because it's not the, art, it's not the, the artist's pure vision. And um, I've learned, I've been doing commission work ever since I was a student, um, and uh, partly to put bread on the table, to be honest, but also uh, um, because I love to immerse myself in other people's lives. And, um, and because also my work from the very beginning was um, centered and interested on in narrative. And so, the relationship, the artist, in my opinion, my approach, has to be true to all of those three things. When I go to meet commissioners, I don't necessarily know the subject as well as they do. I don't necessarily know the location as well as they do or the people who are going to use it. So they have uh -huh. skills and knowledge that I don't have. Mm -hmm. My assumption is that they've asked me to, 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 to come and pitch for a commission because they've seen previous works and think that something in my approach to, tr to, to imagining a solution artistically mm -hmm. could be appropriate for this. The subject, well, some subjects are easier to, to possess and to own than others, but mm. to be true to artistic vision, my artistic vision, I need to own the subject, I need to feel it, I need to believe it, 
a bit like a, probably a film director. I need mm -hmm. to, um, it needs to become true for me. Mm -hmm. The most difficult subject that I've done to date in that respect was the Queen Mother Memorial. Having done pilots of the Battle of Britain, drama, action, um, almost like a comic strip of energy and, and, and emotion, the Queen Mother's life was handshaking, horse races, and gin and tonic. <laughs> and that did not fire my passion until I started to unpick the story and look for those iconic moments where I could at least give something of me. And it turned into uh -huh. uh, uh, one scene during the war in the Blitz when the king and queen went to see people who had had their belongings obliterated by German bombs. That gave me the chance mm. to create a sense of connection, emotion, and tension that allowed me to start telling a story. Mm. And the other side of the picture is the queen presenting a cup at a horse race, but in fact, she's a tiny image, and there's just a sea of figures around her, and all those figures is th are figures from the English social scene, mm -hmm. the toffs and the and the betting people, and you know, it's a, it's a sort of, it's like um, a 19th century narrative painting where the characters themselves become theatrical and over the top. Mm -hmm. So I found my interest, some, you know, eventually in the subject. The relationship between the commission of the artist comes to the, to the table with some ideas, but not solutions, necessarily. Mm -hmm. um, I try to propose a direction of travel so that together the commissioner and the artist, or the commissioners and the artist, enter into a conversation and, and surprise themselves by what they discover. It is a meeting of minds, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. And so I try and take the subject hostage, I try and take the commissioner hostage, uh -huh. and do you know what I mean? It's, yes, it's I do. I'm trying yeah. to win, but also I am open to be led um, and to, to dialogue, because yeah. I will learn. Yeah, that's fascinating. I, I am going to ask one more question. I'm sorry, I can't help myself. Um, it's probably a coincidence that this work was commissioned at a particular point in global history, but especially our national history, when the ethics of Mr. Rogers, um, the values of Mr. Rogers, um, seem especially poignant and in need. Um, and I, I wonder, how aware were you through the process of the kind of turmoil, tension, and polarization uh, that was happening here in the US, and how Mr. Rogers is sort of in dialogue with us all the time. Mm -hmm. He's our better angel, mm -hmm. you know, watching the mm -hmm. nation mm -hmm. incapable of manifesting a lot of the values that he It's really interesting because during the process, the same turmoil that was igniting in America I think was somewhat artificially superimposed onto the British population. Mm -hmm. and, and it became an excuse for people to rampage, to express hostility and uh, anger at all so in all sorts of ways. Um, and, and that was going on while I was making this project in my blissful paradisiac corner of Burgundy, yeah. totally lost in birdsong and clouds and trees. <laughs> But I, I listen regularly to dialogue, to discussion, to debate, whether it be on YouTube or TED Talks or whatever. I'm very aware of the political um, and um, philosophical um, and ideological and iconographic tensions yes. that exist in our society. I was asking myself every day, firstly, how would Mr. Rogers feel about these expressions of outrage or or uh, self-righteousness, yes. or division, and what words would he have, or, or what, how would he mo wish to appease, to, to, to help simmer down, to turn down the gas mm -hmm. on all this vacuous hot air at times. People have grievances, sure. But um, Mr. Rogers, I'm sure, firstly, would have wished for people to, 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 if they had grievance and if they needed to look to criticize, to turn that question to themselves first. Mm -hmm. To say, you know, 
we should be hypercritical of our own actions and of our own thoughts, sure. Mm. And Mr. Rogers' attitude surely was of great genu generosity and respect to those around us, Absolutely. whatever they're thinking, whatever they're, they're whatever sort of position they're coming from. So respect and calm. Yes. He was a master of politeness and good manners. Yes. And I think that good manners actually are very important in society in allowing us to be different, yes. but be together, to love each other yes. respectfully with our differences. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. And I do think I do think that Mr. Rogers showed us that kindness can be a kind of social activism. You know, that you don't, yeah. you, you, the only way to persuade someone is not with a louder voice, but sometimes with a quieter voice. Yeah, yeah. So One I am going to interject with hopefully a somewhat quieter voice. This has been such a wonderful conversation. We're coming up on the hour and I wonder if you might be able to include a few members of the Lovely. audience in the conversation you, and then perhaps move out um, to the amazing sculpture and talk a bit more there. Be delighted. Thank you. Why don't you recognize people, Susan, then Paul will respond. Well, your hand went up almost <laughs> instantly. Please mm. jump in. Oh. When I view the configuration here, this is a compositional question. Had the liberal Miss Platt had the plaits down her back, say, which is a more common hairdo, yeah. um, the composition would be quite different. Yes. You, you really feel that so beautifully. I wanted to know how that came about. How That's did a you brilliant question. Oh, that really is yeah. because. They weren't there, and I had some. I had these <laughs> buns on the side of that girl's oh head. No. I had these buns, and <laughs> and I thought buns were okay. Um, and then a, a Canadian lady came in, and she didn't like the buns at all. <laughs> and she said, "You've got to do something with that hair." Well, I then remembered. I then remembered that I'd been in the child development centre here in Rawlins, taken lots of photographs. I spent a morning. I'd spent a morning playing with children and watching them. And I had a photograph of this beautiful young girl, and I think she's from his Hispanic origin, and she had these plaits like out here <laughs> and down there. <laughs> and and J when Julie had said to me, the buns are awful, that gave me a little bit of a prod in the ribs to do something a little bit more ambitious. <laughs> so I, I used the, the young ladies, I was inspired by the young ladies' hairdo to have them coming out and round, and actually, they change, they give a little bit of air to the s top yes. of the sculpture. Yes. They just, a little bit of drawing in space rather than all massive and solid. I, and I think they just made a lovely difference, a decorative Nailed difference. <laughs> Thank you. Why, why did you go so far away to get the bronzing? Is the lost wax process now a, a, a lost job? Or? A dying art? No, fortunately. Um, but foundries, uh, well, I, I won't get into what it's like working in France. And we won't talk about, you know, French labor laws and all the problems that French businesses have. Suffice to say that I have been working with um, a Czech foundry for the last 10 years or so. I work with the Chinese, I work with the Belgians. I mean, horses for courses, as we would say in England. Um, but in this case, um, the Czechs were... They're very hardworking. Um, the price is acceptable within the budget of the sculpture. It's close enough for me to get to relatively easily. It's about a 12 hour drive to the foundry. It's a long way, but you know. Um, and um, they have the, the, the necessary craft skills to reproduce almost to perfection the, the detailed modeling on the clay. They had cast, prior to that, uh, the monument to Iraq and Afghanistan in London, um, and we'd done work in New Zealand together and in Moscow, and um, so I had perfect confidence in them. So we can take one last question, I think, over here. So I have a question that's more directed to President 
um, Cornwell, but could you could also answer it if you feel the need to. In our community at Rollins, we um, focus a lot on global citizenship and values, and we have been seeing that um, through this conversation that that's important towards the Mr. Rogers um, statue. But I want to know what is how it is more important to our students, especially the art department, because it's pretty, um, pretty amazing to see like artistic um, recognition in our community, especially because I feel like our art department's kind of overlooked. So I wanted to know how you feel that um, this could um, positively impact our community with Rollins in conversation with like the art department and art recognition. Sure, thanks for that question. That's a very interesting question. Um, you know, we think a lot about this campus as a, learn, as, a, as a learning space, a living learning space, and we take great care and thoughtfulness to campus design and, and what is where, thinking mostly about landscape architecture and the actual architecture. But to me, the reason you have a campus is to provoke conversation and reflection. And so the more that we can put provocative art uh, you know, have it be part of our campus, the more we are prompting and promoting occasions for conversation. Either conversation between a viewer and the piece of art, or between yourself and your peers who go look at the art, you know, are in dialogue with the art, talk about why this piece here, what you like about it, what you don't, and then you start talking about what it means. And when you do that, you're engaging in the very process of liberal education. So to me, the more we could have art around campus, uh, the better for our mission, which is why I have to make a segue, which is why I'm so thrilled with the, with the Alfon collection, because the fact that the Alfon Inn is itself um, a gallery, and the fact that we have this incredible collection of contemporary American art that speaks to the issues of our mission, uh, to me, uh, just demonstrates in a very rich way how art contributes to, contributes to the mission. And uh, yeah. So for those of you that are able and interested, we are now going to move out to the beautiful sculpture and continue just a bit more conversation with Paul Day. In the meantime, could you join me in thanking both Paul Day and President Grant Cornwell? Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Grant. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay, I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Of course I did. It's lovely. Great. It's lovely. I, I love talking to you. Well, 